All right, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Lauren Wenzel. I'm with the National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA, and we're happy to co-sponsor this webinar with OCTO. Uh, today's topic, we're gonna be talking about gaps in protection of important ocean areas, a spatial meta-analysis of 10 global mapping initiatives. So I'm very happy to introduce our speakers today, which I'll do in a moment, but I just want to remind you all that we uh, want to make these webinars a conversation, so we wanna hear from you. So please use the chat uh, function to type in your questions. And after the presenters are done, we will go ahead and get to all of your questions. So uh, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. First, we have Ellen Pickich, who is the inaugural endowed professor of ocean conservation science at the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University. And she is a world renowned expert on fisheries and ocean conservation science. And her contributions span the gamut from basic science innovations to domestic and international policy changes. Next, we have uh, Tasha Generis. She is an assistant professor at the Environmental Studies Department at Gettysburg College, and her research interests include foraging and spatial ecology. And last, we have Christine Santora, who is the assistant director of the Institute for Ocean Conservation at Stony Brook University. And she has over 18 years of experience in ocean conservation and policy, and has a master's in marine affairs from the University of Rhode Island. So welcome to all of you and I will turn it over to you, Ellen. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, so I think we'll just head right into the slides. And here we go. So today's conversation is about opportunities for protection of global marine priority areas. And I'm gonna kick this off um, basically with, uh, oops, there it goes again. I'm gonna kick this off by giving you an understanding of how the study came to be and how it was done. So next slide, please. Many of you will be familiar with the sustainable development goals and my shorthand way of referring to these is that it's the world's to-do list in September of 2015, the nations of the world got together and agreed on these 17 goals um, for the period of time of 2016 through 2030. So one thing that um, really is remarkable in this set of goals is that we have goal 14, which is a goal exclusively devoted to ocean issues. The Millennium Development Goals, which preceded these goals, did not have a standalone ocean goal. So this was, this was a big accomplishment. Goal 14 has many targets in it, and target five, which is the one we're focusing on today, is to protect 10% of the ocean by 2020. Next, please. One of the organizations that worked hard to get the ocean um, established as a standalone goal at the United Nations is the Ocean Sanctuary Alliance. And this organization was co-founded in 2012 by Ambassador Stuart Beck from Palau, who was a real champion for the oceans at the United Nations. Um, he and others of us worked together to try to get the ocean to be a standalone goal with science as the foundation. And we did this in the years leading up to the 2015 vote at the UN by bringing together scientists and diplomats to exchange information and ideas and explain why it was that this was such an important thing to do. Next slide. Um, and voila, it happened. And at the end of 2015, a 10 by 20 steering committee was formed with the country of Italy, as well as the Ocean Sanctuary Alliance chairing a panel of five nations and, and the Ocean Sanctuary Alliance. The goal of the 10 by 20 committee was to accelerate the creation, implementation, and financing of marine protected areas to meet the goal of 10% ocean protection by the year 2020. Over the years that the 10 by 20 steering committee met, we had participation from more than 70 nations um, at the United Nations. Next slide. One of the major events that we held occurred in Rome in 2016. 
actually in March. So this is just a few short months after the, the SDGs took effect. And we had um, a conference on marine protected areas and urgent imperative. And interestingly, we had a dialogue again here between scientists and policymakers with about 25 scientists who are experts in marine protected areas and diplomats and others from more than 33 countries around the world attending this conference. The idea was to share information, experiences, ask questions about marine protected areas. How do we, how do we get more of them? Because we're way, we were way below the 10% goal. And what do we need to do to make them effective? And one of the major outcomes of the conference was, next slide, something called the Rome Call to Action. And for those of you interested, you can see at the bottom of this slide, um, it's, it's available online. So the Rome Call to Action was agreed by all the participants in this uh, Marine Protected Area Conference held in Rome. And it had several points in it. And the one that we'll focus on today is point number four, which is to map and describe areas where marine protected areas are especially needed. I would say that pretty much all through the conference, the diplomats were asking the scientists, were saying, look, we understand the value of marine protected areas, and we'd really like to see more of them and create more of them, but we really need to understand where should they be put. So can you help us? So that was in the call to action. And next slide, please. Um, the Ministry of the Environment of Italy was gracious and provided us with a grant to do a study to try to address that very question. And the study was published late last year in Frontiers in Marine Science. Uh, the people who are on this panel today, all the co-authors are available either as speakers and or to ask questions of. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this work was done. Next slide. So here's the essence. The essence was um, we wanted to be able to provide a, um, you know, a pretty good comprehensive analysis, but in a relatively short period of time. And what that meant was making best use of the information that was available to us and that was out there in the public domain. And also we focused on initiatives or priority setting exercises that were global in extent and that were accessible. So we had six different United Nations initiatives in our study and four different non-governmental organization initiatives. And what we did was to look at the areas each of them felt was imp were important, overlay the maps on top of one another to see where are the areas where we see consensus that this is an area that is important to protect. And when you look at the map, the resulting map, you see that anything in yellow is an area that at least one of the studies that we looked at one of the 10 studies felt was important to protect. And as the color gets darker and darker, more and more studies agreed that that area was, was significant. The, uh, the highest level of consensus that we saw was in the Galapagos, which had a level of seven. So seven, seven different initiatives all agreed that this was an area that was important to protect. Okay, I will pass the, uh, I guess, Zoom microphone to Tasha now. Thank you, Ellen, for getting us all excited to learn more about the results and or the methods and results. Um, so before I get into the, before I get into the results, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the initiatives we used. As Ellen mentioned, we used six UN initiatives and four NGO initiatives. And one of the things that we thought was really important as part of this was to also consider the criteria that the initiatives used. So as part of this work, we went into the documentation for each initiative 
and look not only at the criteria that they use, but also how these criteria were defined. So this was kind of an expansion on a table uh, in a previously published paper by Dunn et al. in 2014. Some of the take homes from this were that these initiatives used between one and 12 criteria, but for most initiatives, not every criterion needed to be met for them to be considered an important area. The most commonly used criteria were threatened and endangered species, um, but you can see there were a number, number of other criteria that were also used by several different initiatives. The initiatives were also pretty diverse in a lot of other ways um, in terms of their scope and their motivation. So they ranged from having 20 sites to having over 200 sites uh, and from covering about 70,000 kilometers squared to over 80 million uh, kilometers squared of the ocean. Some of them included marine and terrestrial regions, although of course we only looked at the marine regions in this study um, and some of them only included marine regions. There were also some initiatives that focused on exclusive economic zones or some that focused on uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction and some that included both. So they were really a diverse group of different initiatives and we think that actually adds strength because if there is a region that several of these initiatives agreed despite their diversity, it says something about the importance of that region. So I'm gonna walk you a little bit more through the workflow more than anything to get you set up with what results you expect you can expect to see um, in the sorry about that the chat popped up on my screen the results you'll expect to see later on in the presentation so as ellen mentioned we overlaid these 10 initiative maps to get the overlay map and that ranged from one to seven in terms of the overlap we wanted to consider that a little bit further. First, in terms of protected area coverage. So we use WDPA for this, and we were looking at basically a gap analysis. Which of these areas that are identified as important are already protected and which aren't? We took this again a little bit further to think more about factors that influence the effectiveness of marine protected areas. So the level of protection and also the size of these important regions. And lastly, we considered representativeness. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall results, the level of protection um, and the biogeographic representativeness. And then Christine, our last speaker, will talk about exclusive economic zones. So I'm gonna show that the map in a minute that Ellen introduced a little bit earlier. But before I do that, I wanted to just talk about the overall coverage. And what we basically found was that 55% of the ocean was identified as important by at least one initiative. And of course, the highest coverage was in areas identified by just one initiative. And as we get into higher levels of overlap, the area gets lower. Another thing to note here that's important is that as more initiatives overlapped, the percentage of that area that was protected also was already protected was also higher. So only about 8% of these regions identified by one initiative was protected, but almost or 100% of the areas identified by a high number of initiatives was protected. And Christine is going to talk a little bit more about this later. So now if we look at this spatially, which I think is of much more interest to most people um, here, we can see, we can start to see where there are hot spots, areas that there are, there is really a lot of moderate to high consensus. So anything from two and up in terms of number of overlapping initiatives. Some of the areas that we found to have the most consistent high overlap were the Mediterranean, Madagascar and surrounding areas, Coral Triangle, the Caribbean, and then areas of the Pacific Ocean. The other thing I wanted to note here was that we took into account the size of the contiguous regions. So one of the things that we know is that size really affects how uh, effective a marine protected area is. Um, so using the cutoff from Egger et al. 2014 of 100 kilometers squared, almost all of the area that was identified by this analysis was in contiguous regions of greater than that size. The other thing that was interesting was that there was 40 areas that were 100 
thousand kilometers squared or greater in contiguous size. And so those might be good candidates in the future for um, either very large marine protected areas or uh, networks of smaller protected areas. The last thing I wanted to mention was that in addition to looking at whether the areas we identified were protected, it's also interesting to look at whether the current marine protected areas are in regions identified as important based on these 10 initiatives. And so we found that 66% of the current coverage of marine protected areas does overlap with these areas identified as important by these 10 initiatives. I'm gonna talk about two more details with this. So the first is the level of protection. So if we take that previous map and here, anything outlined in blue is an identified region, but these areas that are filled in blank here are areas that are um, not protected. So if we just focus in now on the areas that are protected, we can think a little bit more about the level of protection. And what you can see here that stands out uh, really vividly, I think, is the fact that so many of these areas, their, their no-take status is not reported in WDPA, or at least was not reported as of January of last year. Uh, about 20% of the areas are do have full no-take, and another 20% are some no-take, um, again, as of January of last year, in terms of identified areas that are protected. An important thing to note and something that we'll discuss a little bit more later is that as you move up in terms of level of consensus, so the higher the consensus, the more of that area is protected, uh, but the less of that actually has uh, full no-take status in WDPA. Um, a lot of that, those six or seven, those protected areas do not have a reported no-take status. So even though more of that area is protected, the level of protection might not be sufficient. The last thing that I'm gonna talk about today is biogeographic representativeness. So here we use the marine ecoregions of the world and pelagic provinces of the world. We use this spatial scale because uh, pelagic provinces don't get to any smaller spatial units than provinces. And what we're gonna look at here is the percent protected versus the identified area. The color of each, each dot here is a province and the color of the dot tells you something about the average level of consensus in that province. So you can see that in general, if we look at this 10% line, um, over half of the provinces globally actually have less than 10% of their identified area protected. And this is in line with a slew of other recent studies basically showing that we need to improve the biogeographic representativeness of the protected area network globally. Um, actually, 25% of these of the area that was protected and identified fell within just one pelagic province. What we really want to start doing is zooming in on the areas that have low levels of protection, but a lot of area that has been identified as important. And so we're going to zoom in here to areas um, in this corner of the graph. So with a lot of identified area, but less than 5% protection. Uh, I want to note that in opposition to these areas without a lot of protection, there are some provinces that do have, again, um, not thinking about no-take status, do have high levels of protection. Um, so Galapagos and Easter Island both have 100% protection of identified areas within their province. If we zoom in again, we can start to kind of pick out these provinces that have uh, a lot of identified area, not, um, not, but that are not yet protected. Uh, an example here is the Mediterranean, which we pointed out earlier. So this has, again, high consensus levels, uh, about three to four area weighted average of consensus, but less than 5% protection and is, um, yeah, so as a region we could focus more of our efforts. And in this figure here, anything in gray is a pelagic province and anything in black is a marine ecoregion. That I'm gonna pass it on to Christine, who's gonna talk a little bit more about um, exclusive economic zones and no take status and the implications of the study. Thanks. 
Tasha, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tasha. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our gap analysis and some key takeaways of our study. So stepping back from some of the more detailed results that Tasha presented, when we think about the purpose of the study, we wanted to use these 10 globally recognized maps to highlight which areas of the ocean are really important. We also wanted to, to look at these areas of importance and see where they are in the context of global MPA coverage. So looking at our results, which areas seem to be the most important? Well, we can look at the consensus level. We have this area of high consensus, which means between five and seven maps agree. Well, our results show that between 94 and 100 percent of this consensus level is actually already contained within current marine protected areas. So it's not the best opportunity in terms of creating more protected area, but we should really look at how well these areas are protected within those MPAs because we can see that between five and seven maps are agreeing that the area is important. An interesting finding of our study is that out of the moderate consensus areas, which means that between two and four maps identified a particular area, we found that 88% of that area was unprotected. That represents 14.5% of the ocean and 46 million kilometers squared. I'm not able to advance. Okay. Sometimes, okay. An example of um, a region where there was a lot of important but unprotected area is in Madagascar and the surrounding waters. So this is a screenshot of our online map, which I'll give you the link to at the end of my section. What you can see here is um, the levels of agreement uh, increase as the area gets darker. So you can see a lot of areas of orange in this map. The green lines represent current boundaries of marine protected areas and the gray dashed line represent exclusive economic zone boundaries. So we can see this is just a representation of what we're talking about when we when we talk about the gap analysis, identifying areas of importance that are currently outside of current MPAs. So our online map we hope will direct um, users and countries to look at areas of importance and look look at the, the, um, the level of consensus and see, you know, does it make sense to expand certain areas in, of MPAs or create new ones? The emphasis here I wanna point out again is the level two to four of consensus that we found in our study, the emphasis to, is to protect more of these areas. But protecting new areas isn't the only opportunity. We do need to identify the right areas, but we also need to protect them better. We know that no-take areas are key to, con to achieving good and strong conservation outcomes. We also know that right now we have a very low level of fully and highly protected areas around the world. Um, MPA Atlas shows us that only 2.5% of MPAs are in the fully and highly protected category, which means that the whole rest of the ocean, which is 97% around, is either not in an MPA or it's in an MPA with a bit of weak weaker protection, which means more human activity, less biodiversity conservation. So we wanted to look at our results in the context of, of, um, of this fact. So we found that only 18% of our consensus areas in the study were within no-take MPAs. When we look at the high consensus areas, which are between five and seven maps agreeing, we found that only 25% of those really important areas are within no-take MPAs. An example of this is in the Galapagos. There, were, there was a high level of agreement among the initiatives that the area around the Galapagos is really important. We can also see that it's currently within an MPA. But this MPA is actually unreported. The status of the no-take no status is unreported with the WDPA. And we know that there's also some reporting, there's reports of lack of enforcement and lack of compliance. So, we know that these areas are important because so many initiatives identify them as important. But when we look on the ground, we have to understand the level of effectiveness that's happening on the ground. So the emphasis here is to look at these areas of high consensus and to see, check them out and say, are they really being effectively protected? And if they aren't, how can we strengthen that protection? Finally, I'll talk about our results in the context of EEZs. So EEZs means exclusive economic zones, which are, which are um, areas within a national jurisdiction. 
out of all of the area of our study results, which are anything over um, between one and seven maps, 58% of the area identified uh, as important was with, within exclusive economic zones. If we look just at the moderate or high consensus areas, 97% of these areas were located within EEZs. We also found that 75% of EEZs protect less than 10% of their identified priority area. We know through the CBD and through the SDGs that countries are committing to protect at least 10% of their coastal and ocean areas. The study shows us that 75% of the EEZs protect less than 10% but still, there's a lot of identified area within their EEZ, so this presents another opportunity. If you take all of the consensus areas from two to seven and protect them within country waters, it protects almost 10% more of the ocean. Our study showed that 42% of the area identified as important was within the high seas. That represents 76 million square kilometers. There have been other studies that look at the high seas specifically and identify important areas on the high seas as well. Um, our study, when we looked at the, high, the, the countries with the highest unprotected priority areas, we found that they were in French Polynesia, Indonesia, Canada, Russia, and the area around Antarctica, which is uh, managed by Camelar. So our study does have some caveats that we want to mention. A lot of the prioritization initiatives weren't intended solely for MPA siting. Some of the regions of the world were not considered in some of the initiatives. Uh, for instance, EBSAs, the United States and other countries. We know that some areas of around the world are under studies. Doesn't mean those area, areas in the ocean are unimportant just because they're not represented in a map. We couldn't consider climate change and how that might influence future priority areas. We understand that there may be issues with um, accurate reporting from countries to the WDPA on their current MPAs. And we didn't include academic studies at the global level. So just to review some key takeaways, a lot of important information already exists. There have been a lot of efforts that have gone into creating these globally relevant maps. And we think that there's no need to reinvent the wheel. The power we think of our analysis is to take the information that has been put together out there by these different initiatives, put them together to show the power of all that information that went into developing the maps. Once we did that, we found that 55% of the ocean was identified as important by at least one global initiative. Many countries have important areas in their waters and they have opportunity to protect them. And finally, we wanna show an online platform that can be used as a tool to highlight important areas at a finer scale that can then be evaluated at the local level with additional information. So as we published this study in Frontiers last October, we realized that the figures published in the paper are very useful and they support our data, but they weren't really user-friendly in terms of trying to zoom in on a particular area and understand how many initiatives are agreeing also in terms of the context and, and the relevance to current MPAs that are already out there according to WDPA. So what we did was we created an online platform. I wanna thank my colleague Maria Grima at the, in the Pickage Lab at Stony Brook who developed this online map. And we're able here, you can write the link down or take a screenshot. You're able here to zoom in on any area within the world and understand to a greater degree um, our results. So um, thank you for your attention. Here again is the link to the online map and our email addresses in case you have um, any additional questions after the webinar. All right, thank you, um, all three of our speakers. That was, a, that was a great overview of the paper. So I'd now like to encourage all of our um, webinar participants to send your questions either to the Q&A box or to the chat box. I know some of you have done that, so we'll be taking a look at those in just a second. Um, and in the meantime, you know, folks want to turn on your cameras so we can uh, see our, the folks who are talking. Uh, I will go ahead and, and look at some of these questions. Uh, so this is uh, from Seth, and, and I know some of these things you addressed in part, but you may want to deep a little, uh, dive a little bit more deeply into your answer. Um, Seth asks, I'm curious, how did you adjust for the number of studies in a particular region? I would imagine that there's more research being done 
uh, in tropical regions, coral reefs, and places like the Mediterranean than in more remote or polar regions? And was the study looking for places that are important just for biodiversity or for geophysical or other types of processes as well? Um, I guess I can, I can try answering that one. Um, so we basically, each of the studies was global in extent. So they, fo they didn't focus in, in a particular type of region for the most part. Um, they, they all pretty much were global. So I think that, that that was enough to just say that these are on equal footing and that we can look at them all together. And what was the second question? Oh, the second question was whether they were all focused on biodiversity or might have had other um, characteristics like geophysical importance or other types of uh, a criteria. Yeah, so that was, um, that was actually in one of the slides that Tasha showed what the exact criteria were. It's interesting that a lot of them did have something to say about biodiversity, but in slightly different ways. Um, for example, one of the studies has a main, as a main criterion um, the, the amount of vulnerable species that are vulnerable to extinction, whereas others might have the total number of species. So different ways of characterizing that. But we also did use, one of the, one of the UN initiatives we used was World Heritage Sites, and those most definitely do use criteria that go way beyond biodiversity and look at the lengths and the importance of these areas to uh, human culture and history. Great, thank you. Um, and then there was also a, a related question about the criteria that you used, wondering if there was um, a lot of overlap between the UN and NGO uh, criteria and whether that might um, create some overrepresentation of certain types of criteria. Yeah, I, I could take this one. Um, I think that was one of the things that we kind of, we thought a lot about was like how you weigh different things. And we decided to weigh things equally with the idea that if several, it was almost like a vote by the initiatives on which criteria were most important. So um, if several criteria were considered, if a criterion was considered by several initiatives, yes, that the areas identified are going to be kind of more biased towards that criterion, but um, I think that's okay because it's kind of, it's saying that, you know, seven out of 10 of these initiatives thought this criterion was very important to, to use to identify areas. So that, so I think it's okay that the criteria was used several times because um, that just shows it's of extra importance in terms of choosing these regions. Got it. And uh, I just want to recognize my colleague, Mimi Diorio, who's joined us, uh, who's involved in some of the mapping initiatives from the MPA Center. Um, and so uh, you'll see her also popping up here. Um, so another question that came up was uh, about uh, whether any of the studies, this is from Jonathan Putnam at the Park Service, do any of the studies look at the issue of marine connectivity and how that might relate to existing and potential MPAs? Do any of these initiatives? Yeah, were, were any of the criteria or any, uh, did the study allow you to look at the issue of connectivity? No, so none, none of these initiatives were necessarily put in place with the idea of creating MPAs, right? Some of them actually explicitly say even in the language that this is not meant to be a management plan, but just an identification of the areas that are important. Um, but it is something that we thought about a lot while writing up our results and considering our results. Uh, and that's, you know, we didn't really look at connectivity and where those smaller networks should be, but because we identified so many large contiguous regions, again, um, 40 of the regions were 100 kilometers squared or greater. Those are regions where we can foresee maybe networks of smaller MPAs being developed, even if very large scale MPAs wouldn't be developed in those regions. Okay, thanks. So uh, an anonymous attendee has asked, do you think that the initiative's criteria may be inherently biased given that marginalized communities are often not consulted or involved in the development of this type of criteria? 
So I think this also gets at the issue of um, sort of local engagement in identifying what areas are important versus perhaps more global or NGO perspectives. Well, just to add to some of the conclusions I presented, um, we don't think this map should be prescriptive. It, it's, it's a guide, it's a global guide, and you know, it's, important, it's an important tool to be able to zoom in. We understand that some of these maps didn't capture every area, you know, and, and maybe there's no perfect way of capturing an area. What we wanted to point out was that countries have jurisdiction over their waters, and in light of the targets that these countries agreed to through the CBD and the SDGs, um, that they actually have important areas in their waters. Once we can point this out at the global scale, you can zero in and look at some academic studies or other local level information that you can then bring in to the process of looking at it by as a, as, on a case by case basis. And um, you know, I, we understand that it can't be prescriptive at the global level or at the country level, sorry. Yeah, yeah thank you. Just, uh, could I just add a point there? Please. So, um, you know, we don't know the extent to which the um, stakeholders were, were involved in some of, in, were consulted in some of these studies. It may be that they were consulted. And I do know that some of the big areas um, that are protected, there has been a lot of stakeholder consultation. But again, um, you know, this is, this is not, we don't, we don't say that this map is the be all and the end all. It's, um, I think, a very good starting point. And as Christine just said, um, this could be used as a great starting point if you wanted to go to an area and find out more about what the stakeholders involved think about these areas. Maybe they have ideas about other areas that are important. Maybe they agree with these areas, maybe they disagree. Um, it's a great way to start a conversation if a conversation hasn't already taken place. Great, thank you. Uh, so another question from Nehiram asks, were the spatial extent of the regions identified based purely on the overlap of the map layers or was there some other criteria that was also included? It, it was really just based on, on the overlap. Okay. And then he also asked if there was a recommendation for the level of protection. I know you, you talk generally about level of protection um, and, and the opportunity to increase the level of protection, but were you recommending any specific level of protection based on this study? Um, we, didn't, we didn't take up that question in this study. So that wasn't, that wasn't a question that this study addresses, um, you know, what level of protection, but we do know from a lot of the science that's been done, particularly in the last decade, that the, the stronger the protection, the greater the benefits of marine protected areas will be. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely an important consideration. There, there was a lot of interest in this issue about um, geographic coverage and potential bias in the selection of the, of the data layers. And I think particularly there's some questions about how the EEZ versus the high seas was covered by these areas. Uh, I know you, you commented on that in general, but is there any um, additional information or comments you'd like to make about sort of the identification of areas in the high seas? Um, I'll try this one too. My, my, uh, You're giving you all the hard ones, Ellen. Yeah, I'm taking the hard ones. Um, so, you know, we took the studies as they came to us. Right, this is, you know, we didn't, we didn't do the original studies. We just pulled the information together. And, um, you know, again, it's possible, it's possible that those studies may have underrepresented the high seas. But one of the reasons that we spent a lot of time um, and put a lot of the figures into, you know, we showed where the EEZs are and where the high seas are, is that unfortunately we do not have a high seas treaty at the current time, which would it make it easier, which, was, which would facilitate the ability to create um, high seas marine protected areas. But individual countries have jurisdiction within their own EEZs, and they have had that power for quite some time. And so in, in terms of implementing the study, implementing the findings of the study, 
um, in the short run, it's certainly relevant for individual nations to look within their EEZs and look at the study and possibly to take action based on that. And, and Ellen, you mentioned in your um, introduction to the study about how some of the um, reasons that you all undertook this based on the questions that you would get from the um, decision-making community. And I'm just curious what kind of response you've heard from folks now that this is out there. Have you heard from countries that have found this an interesting tool and are, are um, interested in pursuing it? Um, well, again, I, I can answer that and also the others can answer that. Uh, yeah, we have we have gotten inquiries of various kinds, um, and we've gotten inquiries from from others who are interested in working in an area. One one of the areas we've heard from is actually the United States. Uh, okay. So, um, but also the Galapagos. One thing I'd like to say about the Galapagos is that even though there is a large marine protected area in the Galapagos region, it does not extend out. To, to the full EEZ of Ecuador and um, you know, within around that MPA. And a lot of that area is uh, shaded between two and four mm -hmm. levels of consensus. So there have been some, some discussions about, hmm, you know, I wonder if that MPA that exists is really large enough to capture all the dynamics um, that are important to capture in protecting that area. So I know you addressed some of these topics or, or noted that you did not specifically address them in your study. So I think what you've got here is a lot of great ideas from your listeners about how to uh, take this the next step when you get additional funding to, to delve in e even more deeply. Uh, there's a comment, have you thought about adding fishing or other extractive uses as a pressure layer? I would expect areas with high convergence and low protection status are likely to have high extractive use. Right, so these are, you know, these are great questions, um, great food for thought, and, you know, hopefully we will be able to move forward and do more with this um, initial study. Yeah, and again, another a comment, um, the, interested in seeing, for example, areas of high tourism pressure or um, areas that may be affected by water pollution. So I think uh, several questions related to um, pressures that might, um, pose additional impacts on marine resources. Uh, here's another question. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Do any of the initiatives uh, include uh, data layers related to underwater seamounts or um, migratory pathways? You know, I think what you see is what you get with this study. Yeah. <laughs> This is probably the easiest answer that I can give. You know, I wish we could have addressed all of these different things. Um, but, you know, there's a lot yeah, of work. Was a, it was a, a policy driven exercise, uh, really coming from leaders that we were working with at the UN on SDG 14.5. Uh, we continue to keep in touch with those ambassadors and those missions and, and policymakers, sorry, UN missions. For instance, um, Ellen mentioning you know, what's the uptake on this? She gave this presentation or a version of it at the mission of Monaco back in December to engage the group of friends and friends in oceans at the UN, which I think, um, you know, is a group of countries that want to keep SDG 14 on their radar, are looking for scientific and other information to help them with impl implementation. And the reaction has been has been positive and we'll continue to try to share science with the um, decision makers. But some of, some of the initiatives that we consider do take these things into account, like bone marine ecosystems, EPSAs, stuff like that, they take into account seamounts. Okay. Um, migratory errors are taking into account with EPSAs too, I believe. So, so they are kind of caps, encapsulated within some of these initiatives, um, but we didn't add that on top. But one of the things we right. talked about in the paper is especially that really large area of the Pacific Ocean, you know, there is a lot of really great available tagging data like the tag, uh, tagging of pelagic predators project that could be used in conjunction with looking at these Id already identified regions to pick out some finer scale um, areas. Yeah, and what I'm seeing is a lot of questions saying, this is great and can you do more? Um, 
particularly interested in, in focusing in on certain geographies, people concerned about the Coral Triangle having a very low level of protection and wanting to see more there. Um, also in Madagascar, um, just trying to figure out like how can they use this data to push this forward. And I promise this one was not me. Um, are there policy recommendations you could give to North America, the US and Canada for implementation? So um, I think- Besides signing treaties? <laughs> Um, well, that's one of the reasons why we put the map online was because we understood that people, you know, it's very hard to zoom in on some of the figures in the paper. And it, this is something that was policy driven. And it's something that many people around the world are interested in. There's a lot of studies out there that are trying to identify areas using additional criteria beyond these 10 maps. There are regional efforts looking at regions using specific criteria to those regions. We wanted this the data we have here to be viewable. And so the online link will allow you to zoom in and do that. And the data is also downloadable so people can, can take that as well. I did see a question here that I can answer quick if that's okay too. Um, someone asked about the percent of marine protected areas that were not identified. So um, it was 66% of MPAs that also fell within the region identified. So about 34% of MPAs as of January 2019 were in a region that were not identified by these 10 initiatives. It doesn't mean they're not important, of course, but um, just to answer that question, it's a, a quick statistic, so. Yeah, and that may point to the, um, to the sort of different processes that are maybe more locally driven around local criteria versus global criteria as you looked at in your study. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a, a comment from Nicola Clark at Pew who works on high seas and she says, I wanted to push back a bit on Ellen's comment about the high seas. It undermines high seas treaty negotiations to have scientific studies that undercount or fail to adequately consider the importance of high seas and their need for protection. We need to demonstrate to countries that the high seas are biodiverse areas worthy of protection and otherwise negotiators won't see the value in, in protecting them. So I guess this is just basically a plea to um, look for uh, data sets and criteria that can in include the high seas and, um, and fully represent them in these kinds of analyses. You know, so again, addressing that, um, if you go back and look at the map, there a lot of the map is, show, is, is focusing on high seas areas. So, um, you know, the high seas areas that were looked at in the 10 studies that we pulled together, there was quite a bit of high seas area. And there are studies um, that are coming out, other studies that are coming out now that are focusing even more on the high seas. So in no way should, um, should this study be taken to under, under count the importance of the high seas. We recognize the importance of the high seas. But again, you know, this is, this is a study that, um, you know, it's in some ways it's a start. I, I hate to just call it a start because so much work went into it and not just the work of our team, but the work of the teams that put together each of the 10 studies that we used. So I think it's, it's a comprehensive start and, um, you know, we're offering it here, not just for information, but for suggestions on how to improve it um, and also you know for others others who want to use it yeah and i think you're you're also seeing some compliments uh james mabunga says i find the tool informative and useful for invoking some much needed discussion um and uh, another uh listener from uh from Greece is asking, how do you see the future of this tool? Um, do you see it going through additional iterations or continuing to live online? Do you have any uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, we, we would, you know, we would like this to be a living, a living document or not, not a living document, a living map that um, gets updated over time, just like the marine protected areas map gets updated as new protected areas are formed. So, um, you know, again, looking at it as, as a very comprehensive start, but one that could be added to over time. And I think that some of the most important ways it could be added to are in, in smaller regions involving stakeholders in those regions and talking about, 
you know, a lot more about the, the local area and different ways of managing um, within that. Great. And Tasha, I see that you're, you're sharing some additional information in the chat. So I just would encourage people to look in the chat um, for some additional links. Um, and, a, and a comment from, from Mimi Diorio in the US that it would be great if the map and data could show which initiatives are present in each place, not just the total number. Yeah, so I think, uh, I think a lot of the other questions have been answered uh, in general, um, just people really um, intrigued and motivated by this. I, there was also a question about, um, can people contribute to the map? Um, and is there a way to contribute information, sort of a crowdsourcing element to this? Um, so I think you're, you're getting lots of ideas for version 2.0 here. Yeah, well, you know, we, uh, we really appreciate so many people listening in and, and weighing in, asking questions and giving comments. So I think that's, uh, that's a real testament to the amount of interest there is in this topic. And I hope that interest will continue. So I'm just going to, a couple more comments have come in here. Uh, the tool looks great. I am looking at how to overlap MPA development with shorebird sites in, for near shore MPA designation. Shorebirds are often left out of the decision making process and it would be great to add that layer to this one. Um, that's from Matthew Jeffrey. And uh, another comment, could the difficulty of your study and its acceptance come from se selecting places that are more important than others? Well, among us ocean enthusiasts and lovers, we wouldn't like to see any ocean place get savaged because it is less important from Adrian Landa. Um, I think that's a, a, almost a philosophical comment about um, identifying important places in the ocean, which those of us who are in, involved in MPA, <laughs> you know, necessarily have to do. But I would just, I would just, just add to Adrian's comment that um, as we think about what's going to replace the 10% goal under the Convention on Biological Diversity, there is a lot of discussion now about not only focusing on an MPA goal, but also um, emphasizing the importance of managing the rest of the ocean in a sustainable way. Right. Um, and calling that out specifically as a goal so that it's not implied that, you know, if you're not in an MPA, that anything goes. Good point. Yeah, that is a good point. You know, so this, um, this goal, SDG 14.5, the, um, you know, the end date is the, the end of this year. And um, I'm not sure when the CBD is going to take place. It was supposed to take place this October. Right. Don't know if that's still on. But, you know, this, there are a whole bunch of interesting discussions that will set new targets, um, probably not just for MPAs, but hopefully for a broader set of things. Okay, and there's one last question, and, uh, which is, can your paper be accessed for free? I would like to use it for discussion with my class. Yes. It is. It is uh, open access. Great. And um, yeah, easy to find online and download it. Great. All right, I guess I would just like to turn to our three speakers and say, ask if you have any closing words as we wrap up here. Anything else you'd like to add as we, as we say goodbye? Well, just thank for having us the opportunity to present yeah. our work and, you know, we uh, Things like this will help move the field forward, uh, you know, despite any caveats, you know, these these tools will help us continue to move the field forward and understand more about effective Effective identification of areas and also, you know, we have to focus on the implementation as well. So it's a two pronged effort and um, thank you all for joining. Yes, and thanks, you know, thank you again from from me it's um again really 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 nice to see so many people have joined in and listened in and and care about the ocean yeah and i think people are very interested in this tool and the work that you've done seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat box and the q a so i just want to thank you all for joining us and i want to thank octo for um, co-hosting this event and we hope that you'll join us on future webinars thanks everyone thank you thank you, thank you.